primary location at the time in the back of the Union Building on the U of E campus, and then to its own facility at U of E, and finally out to the University of Southern Indiana, where it is now. So, and now you're about to embark on a whole new program with the building downtown. That was unimaginable 44 years ago. <clears throat> As we mature, I, I like that term more than get old. Um, I, I think that we gain a perspective that sometimes the young can't appreciate. An old professor of mine up at IU by the name of Dr. Joe Thompson would always say, there are three things you need to know about any given topic. In fact, he felt that you could only remember three things about any particular topic. And so I ask your indulgence today as I go over three things about three things. So the first thing I want to talk about is your life. Number one, life's a journey. Treat it as such. You never get to the end until it's at the end. One should never encourage it to move faster because once it starts to speed up, you can't ever slow it down. Enjoy the little things in life and take pleasure in growing old, hopefully with your life partner. Two, be honest. Be honest when speaking with your patients. They want to know the truth. Don't be harsh or uncaring, but don't build false hopes. Just tell it like it is. And be honest with yourself also. Not critical. We all criticize ourselves enough. Just be honest in your self-evaluation. Three, laugh. Use humor in your practice. Being a gynecologist a few years ago, my nurse put up pictures that she found of male models and stuck them on the ceiling above the exam beds. <laughs> and so when ladies would lay back, they'd be like, oh. <laughs> I had an octogenarian lie back one time, and I hear just maybe just a few weeks after she had put up the pictures, and she like, oh. and I didn't know what to take that as, and I told her, I said, oh, I'm, I'm very sorry if that upsets you, and she says, Dr. Brown, I'm 84, I'm not dead. <laughs> <laughs> and take the opportunity to pull pranks on those with whom you work, because uh, it keeps the, keeps the mood light and it keeps them guessing, because they're not going to know what happens next. When I showed up to teach in my full Klingon dress uniform two years ago on Halloween to the second year students, the look on their face was priceless. Part two, your practice. Number one, pay attention to your patients. They not only deserve it, but it's what they're paying you for. Get your nose out of the damn computer and look at them when they talk. <laughs> That's called being a good listener, and it's what we've lost as a society. <coughs> I had a third year student from Terre Haute two years ago, and I was talking to him about that very same thing, and we went into the exam room, and I sit down to talk to this patient of mine, and she just stops me in the middle, and she turns to the student and says, young man, this is why I don't mind coming in to see my gynecologist, Dr. Brown. He talks to me. He listens to me. He looks at me. He doesn't have a space staring at a computer screen like the rest of my doctors do. And if you really listen to what they say, they'll probably tell you what's wrong with them. How much easier is it to make a correct diagnosis when you have time to collect a good history? Two, you're involved with learning the science of medicine. However, you must learn the art of medicine. It's just as important as the science, as the science and maybe more so. Doctors, for the most part, are given a special dispensation, if you will, to touch people. Take advantage of it. When I make rounds, I'll sit on the side of the bed, I'll put my hand on the patient's arm, I'll wiggle their big toe, I'll touch them. You know, one of our primal instincts is to appreciate the touch of others, and the magic of a touch reaches deep into our very existence. Use it to show your compassion. Three, communicate. Talk with your colleagues. Don't assume they're going to 
peruse your entire mostly worthless electronic medical record to get that one kernel of information that they really need. If you're referring a patient or if you've had a patient referred to you, write a damn letter of introduction or a letter back to the referring physician and tell them what you found. Talk to your patients in understandable terms. My father never had the opportunities that he provided for me. He never even graduated high school. And I was in Jasper less than a year when he called me up one day and said, he had a question, could I please come out to his house? I did. I did everything my dad told me. <laughs> and he said he'd been to see his family doctor and he told him something about his blood pressure and this and that and he had no idea what, what he had said. So I called his family doc up, who by the way is a wonderful, and was a wonderful family doctor. And he told me all about it, explained it quickly in doctor talk, because that's what we do. We have our own language that we use. And so I turned around to my dad and I broke it down into simple, easy to understand words and concepts. My dad looked at me and he said, now, don't you ever talk to a patient with those big words you learned in school. Keep it simple and don't ever assume that we know what you're saying. You know, I've seen patients sit there when, a, with, when other doctors talk to them with those big terms and they'll sit there and they're nod and they're nod and they're nod. And the doctor leaves and said, you know what he said? Hell no. <laughs> because they don't want to seem stupid. So break it down. Just, just pretend like you're talking to a Purdue graduate and use a little <laughs> It works for me. <laughs> and the last one, altruism. Be part of your community. Do something anything to help out in your community. I used to go to a fifth grade class and I read The Hobbit 45 minutes a day, once a week, every year for 20 years. I was on the Arts Commission, I helped with the local university foundation board. The thing is, you just have to make the time. Sometimes you have to make the time to do these things. Most of us went into medicine to help, and this is just another way to do so. Second part, be active in your hospital. Volunteer for committees. Listen, everybody's got a family they wanna go home to, and they wanna see this child's softball game, and that child's this, and their husband's or wife's that. But you know what? Those committees, somebody's gotta do it. Everybody needs to take their turn, so take your turn. Do a good job, set an example, so that others might take the initiative and volunteer as well. And finally, give back to your school. The IU School of Medicine and the Evansville Center have provided you with unbounded opportunities. Yes, I know, you pay tuition. But that only covers a small fraction of the cost. So donating your time or donating your dollars years from now helps future generations of <coughs> medical students. I didn't get to where I am today on my own. I didn't receive the High Medallion or the Soros Community Physician Award by relying on myself. I got here by standing on the shoulders of those who came before me, as have so many of the older physicians in the room. The result of that concerted effort is the new construction that will, will be seen now in downtown Evansville. And eventually, students, it will be your turn to stand on the shoulders of the older doctors in this room and keep the dream of the Evansville Center and the IU School of Medicine green and growing. Have a great career. currently have 450 active 